in terms of you know having a high highly unionized more regulated capitalist system yeah i'm there with i'm de- there with jeremy and liz warren and the like i'm bethany mclean did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea. And I'm Luigi Zingales. We have socialism for the very rich, rugged individualism for the poor. And this is Capital Isn't, a podcast about what is working in capitalism. First of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? And most importantly, what isn't? We ought to do better by the people that get left behind. I don't think we should have killed the capital system in the process. Today, the prevailing form of capitalism is neoliberalism. I think people would define neoliberalism as a set of beliefs and policy recommendations that emphasize the use of market mechanisms to solve most of society's problems and needs. In recent years, neoliberalism has been under attack from both the left and the right. And I have to say, why the left-wing criticisms of neoliberalism tend to repeat the criticism that the left had for a long time, the right-wing criticisms tend to be a bit more novel, or at least more surprising to me, which doesn't mean necessarily better, but more interesting. At least I want to understand them better. For this reason, in recent past, we have interviewed Oren Cass and Patrick uh, Denin, two conservative critics of neoliberalism. I actually thought it were done when I start reading a book by Sora Bamari called Tyranny Inc., I find this fascinating, this development of neoliberalism and market skepticism on the right. I've long had this theory that most things that we think are at opposite ends of the spectrum actually meet in a circle. (laughs) And this is one of those examples of the truth of that, where really far left progressives and actually the far right are meeting in a similar place on economic issues. But, But anyway, what attracted you so much about Saurabh's book? So the cost of spoiling it for the listeners was the beginning. So the book starts describing three civil rights abuses around the world. So there is a Chinese worker who works uh, under inhumane conditions and at some point tries to strike and is fired. There is a Gazprom employee in Russia whose daily pay is withdrawn if he doesn't attend a Putin speech. And there is a Iranian who is fired for an Islamic behavior, which was discovered because his employer had installed a keylogger software on his computer that recorded everything he typed. Then he tells you that actually all these three examples come from the United States of America. In one case is an Amazon worker. In the second case is a worker from a plant uh, of Shell in Pennsylvania whose workers were forced to attend a Trump's rally. And the last one was from a retailer, G. F. Fisher, where supervisors started to spy on an employee's private life And they fire after she complained. As a writer who has just tried to write a book, I was actually really jealous of his beginning. The head fake was quite compelling. But but as an economist, I'm not surprised that you liked his book more than Deneen's book because it is focused on economics. What about it really resonated with you? I think neoclassical economics ignores, in fact, wants to eliminate even from the vocabulary the issue of power. There's a famous paper on the theory of the firm that claims that firms don't have any more power of fiat than what individuals have in the marketplace. An employee firing a firm is equal to a firm firing an employee. What is funny is I have a colleague who actually uses this language. So when he's upset with United Airlines and decides to start buying all these tickets from American, he goes around saying that he fired United Airlines. And I always ask him, did they did it notice that you got fired? <laughs> and when you get fired from your job, you do notice. Uh, but anyway, I, the irony or the depressing aspect is that this is still the dominant view of the firm in finance, that the firm is just a nexus of contracts with no issue of power. And uh, much of finance is based on this idea. We talk a lot about privilege and how to define privilege. I mean, not us specifically. I mean, society at large. And I was thinking maybe the real definition of privilege is that you do get to fire a company. You do get to fire United Airlines. <laughs> maybe that's when. Anyway, uh, but in this in this respect, right, so, so Rab is very different. He claims that this model of competitive capitalism, the model you're talking about, where coercion simply couldn't take place because no one has power that they can misuse is a myth. And he emphasizes through a lot of his book, The Power Imbalance, between between firms and workers, which which I think is right. Yeah, and he does more than that. He emphasizes the coercive nature 
of market as an institution. To create a market system, capitalists use uh, massively the coercive power of the state. But then, after this coercive power has been used, then there is the issue that everything is voluntary exchange after that. So, in a way, none of his points is novel from a theoretical point of view. So, what, what did you think? What struck you as new? I have to admit, the biggest novelty of all this is that these points have been raised by somebody who likes to call himself a conservative. The other interesting aspect is that this point is made at all. So, today's left is more concerned with gender and race rather than the imbalance of power between companies, especially large companies and workers. This is ironic because if there was ever a moment of great imbalance of power between firms and workers, this is it. It's strange that the left seem to have abandoned it. You know, it's, that's really interesting. I read a critique that resonated with me about today's left, that by defining people into smaller and smaller subsets, you lose commonality. And by losing commonality, you lose you lose power. But yours is a, a different critique and, an, and a really interesting one, which is that the left has also abandoned in some ways the, the economic critique that was a once at the heart of, of what it was to be to, 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 to be on the left. So I, it's, this is interesting. And do you think that this book is just the right rediscovering what the left has forgotten? Or is it something more? And I think hopefully this is what we can learn by talking to Saurabh. I wanted to start with a fairly basic question for you, which is that neoliberalism is a term that gets tossed around a lot now, and a lot of people are opposed to it without really being clear about what they're talking about. So what do you think we're talking about, and where do you think the mainstream critiques miss the mark? The definition I use is not original. I borrow it from a political theorist at Berkeley, Wendy Brown, who in turn draws heavily on Michel Foucault who began talking about neoliberalism in the 1970s. And it's just the idea that whereas classical liberalism nearly said, okay, let the autonomous market alone, now bracket that with the idea that the bringing about of the autonomous market itself required enormous state coercion, but setting that aside, it basically said, leave it alone. Neoliberalism goes much further and says, we should allow the market logics to govern all of societies so that the purpose of government itself becomes to promote the market in every in every square, to promote market type rationalities and measurements in every domain of life. So that, for example, the New York Times did a story about a year ago about hospital chaplains or hospice chaplains. So these are people of faith, you know, priests, rabbis, imams who work with people in their final moments in life, you know, have to fill out productivity scores, et cetera, or scored according to their productivity. That's the kind of intrusion of market logics into every domain of life. Or as Michel Foucault famously put it in this pithy way, neoliberalism seeks to govern society by the market. So the market is no longer just a tool or a place in which we exchange, you know, goods and services, but is the sort of deeper logic of society as such. We had Darren Asimoglu at MIT on, on the podcast, and he wrote a book arguing that a lot of the progress we've seen over the last centuries has not been the result of market forces itself, but rather the result of distinctive choices within within those market forces. And so would you argue that the problems with liberalism and neoliberalism are inherent in the thing itself and driving to a self-destructive endpoint the way perhaps a, a Marxist would? Or would you argue that they're the product of specific choices that can be chosen differently? I mean, I mean, I think some of them are absolutely, you know, inherent to the system itself. Kind of to to historicize liberalism, especially market liberalism, is an ideology that emerged in the in the late eighteenth century in a context in which you did have what are called masterless men. You know, you had typically in the United States there were yeomen, craftsmen, engineers, and so on who really could maybe perhaps deal with each other at arm's length. There were many, many producers in any given market and so on. Technology comes into the picture and the picture of the world that Econ 101 classical liberals painted was no longer an accurate picture of reality because you had typically enormous concentrations of power in most markets, right? But the late 19th century, typically one or two producers or sellers would dominate entire industries. So like, you know, Otis Elevator by the late 19th century dominated 70% of its market or British American tobacco, 90% and so on. And when you're dealing with the, those enormous concentrations of power, you're not dealing 
with a situation in which the price point is this pristine crystallization of supply and demand, or the wage is a pristine reflection of the marginal productivity of a worker, but rather you're dealing with just the ability of a few actors in any given market to set their own prices or decide how they want to treat their suppliers and so on. So all of this, I mean, it it seems to me kind of inherent in uh, the development of the market left to its own devices, combined with technology, I should say, combined with technological development. You know, in that sense, some of the some of the crises, which then you, for example, you have a demand crisis crisis in these economies because labor uh, unions are combated fiercely by governments and by capital, and so people can't you know bar- bargain for wages that are you know just, but not only not that they're they're just, but they're they're not able to buy the goods that they themselves produce, and so you have a demand crisis in the system. So I think in that sense, you're talking about things that are maybe inherent to capitalism to market liberalism itself. I do think there is possibility of choice and contingency in the system more so than a kind of orthodox Marxist would, because we can, you know, within the system, we can do things to make it easier for people to join labor unions or, you know, mount countervailing power as consumers by setting up government supported consumer co-ops in certain markets like utilities, et cetera. You know, what I what I want to see is ultimately a manufacturing oriented high wage economy. Uh, What we have today is a low-wage, high-benefit economy, which is sort of the worst combination you can think of. Now, when we say low-wage, as I I borrow these categories from my friend Michael Lind, but we say low-wage, high-benefit, it doesn't mean that the benefit systems that we have are quite generous, especially in the United States. They're quite miserly, and they're means-tested, and you're sort of, in all sorts of ways, you're disciplined uh, in order to make sure that you really qualify them uh, for them or not. But what it means is that as a share of the total income of working class people, and especially the working poor, however you number them, as a share of the total income that they need to make ends meet, government benefits make up, you know, a quite high degree, up to half, you know, for, for example, fast food workers, about half of fast food workers in the United States rely on public welfare to make ends meet. And that subjects them to this kind of dual coercion, right? They're not only at the mercy of the employer in the sense that their wages are precarious, their hours are precarious, and so on. But on the other side, they're also at the mercy of the kind of welfare administrator. It's like, oh, did you buy a six pack of beer with your benefits and so on with your food stamps? And so I think what we, we should aim for is is the opposite of that. It's, a, it's an, eco- an economy in which people are empowered enough, including through high wages, where they're not coerced like that because it it not only offends our sense of justice but it also means that as it is we collectively as taxpayers are subsidizing low wages for employers Uh, so in other words they privatize the gain and then socialize the costs onto the rest of society so i was really interested in your book and your section about bankruptcy because i've often sort of said that but without really understanding the deeper problems I've, i've argued that people who think there's really such a thing as a free market often are reliant on bankruptcy rules and bankruptcy rules in many ways are a creation of of the state but you have this really interesting analysis of how bankruptcy rules have gotten maybe perverted is too strong a word corrupted i don't know if that's a weaker word anyway can you can you explain to our listeners what actually has happened with bankruptcy rules Yep. So it's sort of the most technical chapter in the book, too. So I'll, <laughs> Of course, I gravitated I'll, toward I'll, that. <laughs> I'll, I'll try my best. But when ordinary people have trouble making ends meet, the bankruptcy system works one day, one way for them. And it can be, you know, quite the kind of coercive system that comes bearing down on them when they have to when they have to declare bankruptcy. It's another story for kind of large corporate debtors in the United States as our corporate bankruptcy system, specifically the Chapter 11 system for reorganizing businesses, has been captured by large debtors and you know a relatively few bankruptcy judges who rule in every way in favor of large debtors to the detriment of you know consumers, workers, and other kind of smaller, more you know aggrieved actors. To give to give an example of that, the bankruptcy process of Purdue Pharma. A lot of people know the Purdue story as, okay, you know, this company manufactured a highly addictive and destructive drug. We're still dealing with a fallout from that. It costs something like $140 billion a year in law enforcement, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera, type costs. What people don't know is that the family, the Sacklers, the family behind Purdue Pharma was able to engineer the bankruptcy process such that they were able to shield 
much of their assets from claimants, but whether it's the federal government or whether it's state governments, insurers, hospitals, and individual consumers who were hurt by their product OxyContin, you know, they're still, the family as a whole are still billionaires. I mean, their collective wealth is estimated now 13, 14 billion. It's less than it would used to be, but still they're definitely in the billionaires club. And so you would think that that's very strange. And how did that come about? It's because they were able to take advantage of this loophole in a way in our bankruptcy laws called third-party releases, whereby actors who are not themselves going through the crucible of bankruptcy get to nevertheless take advantage of bankruptcy's most coercive feature, which is basically stopping all claims against their assets, right? So that's what the Sacklers did. And the way they do that is through, first of all, court shopping, some judges are much much more likely to look favorably on third party releases than others, and Purdue Pharma. I won't go into the details, but use these these unbelievably kind of Byzantine strategies to not only end up in the Southern District of New York, even though you know in some in its its, biz, its business relationships to the Southern District of New York were completely attenuated, but to, in a specific courthouse with a specific judge who happened to have the most kind of pro big debtor views. Now that's coming, by the way, that's coming up for review at the Supreme Court, but it's just an example of, first of all, you know, how large actors can game the system. Second of all, as you said, you know, the, the market order is a product of all sorts of state action. And this is the kind of thing I struggle with the most with my own tribe, as it were, with people on the right who think the market is just this kind of like natural thing that uh, we do together is the market is the friends we make along the way rather than you know a product of the coercive system with state intervention at every step to bring about the kind of neoliberal system that we decided is is the one we want since you are a catholic you appreciate the fact that alan Meltzer was a political economist used to say that capitalism without bankruptcy is like religion without sin it doesn't work <laughs> <laughs> and I think that uh, if you don't fix bankruptcy, you don't, you don't fix the capitalist system. I was more fascinated by the part on arbitration because the part I didn't know. So uh, can you uh, illustrate to your, our listener the, the role actually that Hoover had in uh, trying to have a decent arbitration system and then how this was overturned recently by the Supreme Court? This is the one that really gets my blood boiling. And I think anyone who reads the chapter in the book Hopefully, you know, it'll make your blood boil as well. So first of all, what is arbitration? So arbitration is a very ancient practice. It dates back to the Middle Ages where parties that were in dispute would resolve to have their disputes mediated by a neutral third party rather than going to court. Why? Because courtrooms, even in medieval times, courtrooms were expensive, took a lot of time. Judges and courts often had limited jurisdiction over specific areas and over specific issues that they could legally kind of adjudicate. Whereas in arbitration, you know, you, it's 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 faster, it's quicker. Often in, in the medieval times, it was the Catholic Church who would mediate between, let's say, two feuding families and resolve all their disputes. Especially as capitalism developed in the United States, you know, you had all these merchants going to war against each other. And so the court system was mired in commercial litigation. And often, you know, by the time the litigation was over, the two parties' business relationship would be left in tatters because lawyers are brutal. And they sort of try to take every advantage that the law offers in a way that destroys business relationships. So in the 1920s, various people in the commercial community, including then Secretary of Commerce Herbert Hoover, who would go on to be President Hoover, put their heads together to try to bring about a kind of arbitration system in the United States. We already had arbitration, but federal courts refused to enforce arbitral agreements. So Hoover and others you know, enacted a law called the Federal Arbitration Act, and it was a procedural act essentially directing federal courts to uphold arbitration. But they were keenly aware that the people who enacted the law, they were keenly aware of its possibility for abuse in take it or leave it situations. That is situations of disparate bargaining power where an employer, for example, tells an employee, hey, if you have a dispute, we're going to arbitrate it. So they went out of their way, specifically in the employment context, to exclude employment relationships from the Federal Arbitration Act scope. That arrangement was basically honored for about four to five decades. But beginning in the 19... 
well, one case in the 1960s, but really beginning in the 1980s with the Reagan revolution at the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court began to expand the scope of the Arbitration Act to ever more situations, including eventually to the in, into the employment situation. I apologize. And so that's how we ended up with today's system where, you know, in 2018, the Supreme Court in a 5-4 decision authored by Justice Gorsuch held that an employee of Ernst & Young who had a wage dispute with Ernst & Young, he was not a CPA, he was not a senior accountant, he was just a low-level employee. He alleged that he wasn't paid overtime that was owed to him both under California labor law and under the Fair Labor Standards Act. But Ernst & Young noted that he had signed an arbitration agreement. Now, interesting that they said that he had signed it because when he was employed, the arbitration agreement wasn't part of their relationship, right? It wasn't part of the documents that he had signed. Only months later into his agreement, the company sent a firm-wide email that said, if you show up to work tomorrow, you agree going forward to arbitrate your disputes. Now, a certain kind of classical liberal or libertarian dogmatist would say, oh, well, at that point, you know, Mr. Morris, the, the plaintiff in this case, had the freedom of contract or he could he could renegotiate the agreement. But no one, anyone who lives in the real world knows if your employer tells you, you know, if you show up to work the next day, you agree to arbitrate your disputes. You just show up because you got to pay your mortgage or you got to pay your, you know, elder care. You got to pay for your kids health insurance and so on. So our Supreme Court said, yeah, you know, Morris is actually bound by the arbitration agreement, even though it would have cost him $200,000, and Ernst and Young did not dispute this, it would have cost him $200,000, the cost of the arbitration process, in order to recover about $4,000. So in order to recover to about 2% of the cost of arbitration, he was forced <laughs> to stay out of court. The only way it would have been economically rational for Morris to vindicate rights he already has under the Fair Labor Standards Act is by being able to join forces with others. And remember, the Fair Labor Standards Act is one of these New Deal laws that was aimed explicitly at raising up workers' ability to mount collective action or mount collective bargaining. And yet, our Supreme Court held that, you know, there's a, that there's a liberal policy in favor of arbitration, and that trumps the injunction brought forth by by the Fair Labor Standards Act to encourage, by Congress's explicit will to encourage collective action, that's trumped by by the sort of supreme imperative that arbitration always be upheld. So this is quite common in the economy now. It, in 1992, I, only about two uh, percent of non-union firms used arbitration. Today, a majority of non-union firms use arbitration. Why do I say non-union? And I'll stop here. I know that was a long digressive answer, but the reason I say non-union, because in a union context, actually arbitration is very useful, right? Because you have two parties of relatively equal bargaining power. And if a dispute arises, unions and employers have all sorts of ways to quickly resolve it without need for litigation and in a way that's very fair. But no, in the non-union context, it's completely different. You're like the sole employee going up against Ernst & Young or going against, up against ExxonMobil or Google or Apple or what have you. And you're told to go to a private arbitration chamber. Sometimes that arbitration chamber is like in Geneva or Amsterdam, and it costs 20,000 euros or, or 25,000 euros just to initiate your case. And you're someone who makes like twenty twenty five thousand dollars $25,000 a year as an Uber driver. That's really unfair, but it's become, you know, it's become quite common. Like I said, a majority of non-union firms now use, have arbitration clauses in their agreements with employees. I think that's such a compelling example of this line you write in your book about this discomforting new understanding that coercion is far more widespread in supposedly non-coercive societies than we would like to think, provided we pay attention to private power and admit the possibility of private coercion. Anyway, your comments about unions open up a question. You attribute a lot of the decline in workers' power to the decline of, of labor unions and to the way the 1935 Wagner Act was progressively dismantled. Can you explain how and why that happened? Let's start with a kind of common story you'll often encounter, which is the reason private economy unionization rates declined over the past two generations is because of the collapse in American manufacturing as a result of automation and as a result of globalization. I argue that that's, it's a myth. Yes, the decline in manufacturing employment had some role in the decline in labor unionization, 
or union density, which is the share of workers who belong, uh, who, who are covered by collective bargaining, uh, by collective bargaining agreements. The problem for people who say that it was all globalization and automation, or let's say China and robots, is the fact that if you do statistical analysis, and I, I, I have not, but the folks at the Economic Policy Institute uh, have, if you do statistical analysis and you impose the kind of post-industrial conditions that we have on the economy of, let's say, the 1970s, when union density began to decline drastically in the United States, and you kind of track, continue to track that, it makes not much of a difference, right? It's not, it's not a significant difference, right? So like you can explain the loss of union density or the collapse of union density in manufacturing by referring to robots and China. You can't explain it in these other sectors, which weren't obviously, they're not exposed to the same degree to, to automation and to globalization. So then the question becomes, what explains it? Another explanation is that just unions just became more unpopular over the years. This one, again, there's an enormous amount of kind of empirical literature that shows that lots more Americans want to be unionized than currently have representation. At least, especially right this moment where we're speaking in October 2023, unions are more popular than they have been in more than a half century. But over time, too, I mean, there's, you know, there's there's an MIT study that shows that basically that there, there's about 100 million American workers who would wish to be represented if if this poll, kind of academic polling is to believe, then are actually represented. Okay, so we've ruled out robots in China, and we've ruled out the fact that unions are just unpopular is a kind of popular talking point. Then what remains, what remains is that the United States government got very good at helping corporations union bust, right, to, to go after unions, beginning with the Taft-Hartley Act in the in 1947, and then a series of decisions by the Supreme Court and Republican-dominated National Labor Relations Boards, which just kind of chipped away at the idea that the goal of the Wagner Act is to actually promote labor unionization. Rather, they turned it into you know a situation in which employers have a kind of symmetrical, quote-unquote, free speech right to scare <laughs> their employees about what it would mean to unionize, to bar unions from, you know, parking lots of companies, except in rare situations, and to bar workers from speaking up at captive audience meetings, to bar union representatives from captive audience meetings, to get rid of card check, and so on and so forth, just basically raising up a number of barriers so that that three-stage process that it it takes to join a labor union in the United States, first, you need enough signatures on a petition, about a third, then you need to win an election, then you need to win a contract in a year. All those three steps became much harder beginning in the 1970s as a result of these um, changes in this drift in our labor law, as the Economic Policy Institute argues. You know, capital got very good at waging class war against labor. You're certainly right that that play an important role. There are two other factors which are important. Is One is the movement of industry to the South that are states with a so-called uh, right-to-work law. And second, I think that the mobility of capital a lot of places, uh, if you are confronted with a choice, if I don't build a plant here, I build it somewhere else, even the unions, even if they are present, forced to accept a lot of concession. So they, there is no doubt that the strong mobility of capital has given more bargaining power to capital vis-a-vis labor. And when we hosted Oren Cass, uh, I was trying to figure out whether he was willing to go down the line of uh, restricting capital movement in name of protecting workers. He said, uh, oh, we should restrict capital movement to China for other ideological reasons, but he wasn't particularly willing to state a position in general. So where do you stand on the issue of capital movements? I, I think you're right. The the movement to the South is, is a factor in this, but it isn't much different from, philosophically speaking, it's not much different from moving to Vietnam or China. I think the philosophical point we have to begin with is that there is nothing natural about brutal labor laws in places like China and Vietnam, right? And it's not, it's, there's no like, it's not like their labor laws grow on a special tree that only, is only, you know, available in China or Vietnam. It's just that they have laws like that and they, they oppress their workers. And so I think the philosophical premise we have to begin with is if we still think of it as things that are called American companies that care about, you know, this country and they want to take advantage of the American bounty our in our super productive workers, our rule of law, our stability, 
everything that's wonderful about this country and its people, great. But then you have to have a commitment to the people who are here. And you, you, you can't, at the slightest competitive pressure, up and go elsewhere and try to undercut workers who grew, who built your business, you know, who built your profits. What I'm trying to tell you is I think I'm a little bit more open to restricting the movement of capital than maybe my friend Oren is, at least philosophically. But I'll be honest, I'm not sure exactly how I would delineate at the level of policy, like what it would mean precisely to to insist on long-term commitments to the United States. It's something to think about. It seems to me that many of the problems you address could be fixed through universal health care, higher minimum wage, and a bit more efficient government. Do you need to tear down the entire liberalist system for this? No, no, and 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 I I, I don't um, I don't call for that. What I call for is a restoration of the idea of the socially managed market. You know, it has various terms in Europe. I think the concepts like social democracy or Christian democracy those are the sort of labels that this way of thinking um, took on, or the New Deal order. That's what we're talking about here. And so it's it is not obviously it's not socialism. It's not tearing down. The entire economy and making it, you know, a command centralized economy, but rather one in which, first of all, the state is attuned to the possibilities of market failure and willing is willing to intervene, and so doesn't have this kind of dogmatic market fundamentalism that the market always knows best. It recognizes that, especially in labor markets left to their own, you know, you have these vast disparities in bargaining power, just as. Even under classical liberalism, the state is supposed to intervene against monopoly power in conditions of largely oligopolistic markets in which there are relatively few employers uh, as buyers of labor power and many, many sellers of labor power, the employees. In order for there to be fairness, the state should intervene to make it easier for those on the other side of the market to mount countervailing power, to fight for better wages, greater measure of workplace autonomy, better benefits, and so on. So no, I mean, I, I don't think we need to upend our entire society, which is why um, the book, it, it's, it's a funny kind of reception in the sense that the kind of conservative or libertarian or neoliberal types are like, ah, here we go. Sar Abamari is calling for collectivism or statism. Um, but the smartest critics of the book are actually the Marxists of uh, you know, some the person who reviewed it for Jody Dean for Los Angeles Review of Books. She's a she's a communist, and she notes that this model that I'm proposing is class compromise or a kind of class coordination. In some ways, that makes it small c conservative because what what was the political logic behind the New Deal order was that you know because of the way that labor markets were working out for ordinary people, it was generating enormous frustration, and unless the capitalist class was willing to compromise a bit more, you would get socialist revolution. In a way, socially managed capitalism, social democracy, Christian democracy is a kind of compromise. It's a middle position. It's funny because when I read what you wrote, but particularly listening to some of your interviews in which you make very clear your Catholic roots, reminds me of the Christian Democrats in Italy. Particularly, I don't know if you are familiar with names like Amintore Fanfani, Giovanni Dossetti, Giorgio Lapira. These are people that were the left of the Christian Democrats who governed Italy for the bigger part of uh, since World War II, basically to the fall of the Berlin Wall. And it, what is funny is that they were considered the left of the Christian Democrats, but were considered strongly anti-communist because the, the left was represented by communists who, for the better part of that period, were kind of friends with the Soviet Union and so on and so forth. But today, the, the, that left doesn't exist anymore. I find it uh, a little bit hard to see the difference between you and, for example, Jeremy Corbyn. I, you seem like a pro-life Jeremy Corbyn. Yeah, no, I, I, I would accept that. I, I, you know, Jonah Goldberg, who is a much more conventional American conservative, libertarian or neoliberal conservative, described me as a pro-life New Dealer, and he meant it as a kind of pejorative or as, as an insult. And as one does on Twitter, I immediately seized on it and said, like, happily, I will uh, accept that label. So. In terms of you know having a high, highly unionized, more regulated capitalist system, yeah, I'm there with, I'm de- there with Jeremy and Liz Warren and the like. 
So you have strong views, obviously, on the economic front. You have strong views on the social front as well. Could I say, I like your economic views. I'm going to choose those, but I'm not going to choose your social views. Or would you argue that I'm missing the point, that the two have to go hand in hand, that there's a, even though you didn't write about your social views in this book? That's a very good question. I I, I would say so many answers to that. One is that like in my, I, I run this magazine called Compact and we publish both kind of conservative populists and various shades of progressives, economic progressives from progressive Democrats all the way to Marxists and so on. And I try to convene meetings between these two groups, you know, often off the record meetings to say like, where can we meet each other eye to eye? Because I do think that in this country, reform happens in the center between left and right. And that doesn't mean, I'm not talking about a kind of milquetoast centrism where you take the existing right and left and you say, well, let's like split the difference and see where we end up between the two. But rather people who might have fundamentally opposed worldviews in some ways, but they they share a discontent and they come together to horse trade around their discontents until they reach some cobbled together comprehensive solution. So, you know, so, and then, so to try to think about how, what that con- concretely would look like, Insofar as we have a childcare crisis in this country, progressives have some good solutions. You know, someone like Representative Ro Khanna wants to expand federal support for childcare. Fair enough. But if then you if you then subsidize the ability of some families who want to take care of their kids at home through like tax breaks, child tax credits, whatever you want to call them, then you get to like it's not a win-win, but it's a win enough. So that women who want to work outside the home have that kind of additional childcare support, but we're not forcing all women into market society. Some women want to work from home. We all think like, if you think we should have a higher wage economy, a certain Catholic mentality is, look, we need to have an economy in which a single earner suffices to pay for the expenses of the full family, and uh, the whole family. And that's kind of a patriarchal ideal. Typically in their mind, it's the husband. But if we work toward a more unionized economy, you know, a higher wage economy with wage boards, collective bargaining. In some industries, you just need higher minimum wages or uh, so on. If you work toward that, we may achieve what the kind of conservatives want. And, you know, along the way, we reached what like someone like Liz Warren may want or uh, uh, Bernie Sanders would want. So you, you, you bring together someone like Vance or Senator Hawley and someone like Warren. By the way, some of this cooperation is happening organically, right? Vance and Warren are teaming up on this idea that the federal government should ruthlessly claw back executive earnings at banks that have required bailouts. So I hope not. I hope because I can't I I can't persuade you, I'm sure, on the kind of theological stuff. And I've you know, I've come to the point where I don't want to I've realized that that's a you know, it's a separate issue. Well, like we should be prepared to democratically contest those issues elsewhere. But where we can meet eye to eye, you know, I think left and right should work together. And that's my theory of change is this kind of down the center American reform. It's a, it's This is a very consensus based country, notwithstanding our reputation for being, you know, so independent minded and so on. In fact, it's strictly governed by consensus. Neoliberalism was a consensus, you know, famously Thatcher, when she was asked, what was your greatest achievement? She said, Tony Blair. And so if we're going to replace neoliberalism with something more humane, that's going to happen in that same way as a, as a matter of consensus as well. Thank you so much for your time. This was helpful and interesting. It was a pleasure to have you. Thanks for the time. Thank you both. If you're enjoying the discussions Luigi and I are having on this show, there's another University of Chicago podcast network show you should also check out. It's called Not Another Politics Podcast. Not Another Politics Podcast provides a fresh perspective on the biggest political stories. It's not told through opinions and anecdotes, but rather through rigorous scholarship, massive data sets, and a deep knowledge of theory. So if you want to understand the political science behind the political headlines, then listen to Not Another Politics Podcast, part of the University of Chicago podcast. Podcast Network. So did you hear anything, Luigi, in this, in this discussion that surprised you? Nothing that shocked me, but I have to say I really found it much more authentic than any of the previous people that we interview on the same topic. Hmm. And I wonder, I was looking at his biography, as you know, he immigrated from Iran and he spent his teenage years in a mobile home in Utah. I, I, I don't want to be too sort of Marxist here, but 
the, the past history has a huge impact on the way he looks at things. And so I don't get the impression that I got other times that this interest for Walker's is simply because he sees a electoral market opportunity, that the workers have been abandoned by the left, and so we need to cater to them. Let's give them some token things so that we, they can vote for us. I don't see that. I see an authentic interest, an authentic view. In a way, I really like and respect his idea of, of compromise uh, as being at the core of what we do in America. At the same time, the lack of a overall co- coherent philosophy, given his strong stance on, on, on social issues, I'm also I'm struggling with it a little bit, and I'm trying to figure out why I'm struggling with it, given that I actually liked and respected his answer. And maybe it's just because the math major in me always wants total coherence on all points, even when that's, that's um, impractical. <laughs> Does that make sense? It does make a lot of sense. May I raise another uh, more cynical interpretation? Yeah, of course. Please be cynical. Be my guest. <laughs> I think that the social and gender race issue, I think have been raised to such a high level that makes it radioactive even to think about liking somebody with a different view. And to me, I wonder to what extent this has been instrumental to make it impossible a coalition of people actually who care about workers, for example. And you know that there is a long history in the United States of uh, race being issue to break the labor movement uh, in the past, right? It seems that now, ironically, is raised by people who pretend to care about race or may do care about race, but they use that to make it impossible to form a coalition. You know, that is, um, I love conspiracy theories. And that's, that's, that's actually a really good one. And it, and it resonates with actually things that my, my father talks, talks about a lot. And I, and I, and I, and I wonder if it's accurate. And I wonder, <laughs> I can't believe I'm doing this, but another little plug for my book, but coming out of the pandemic, when we, when we actually did see members of the elite arguing for policies that benefited them precisely because it came at no cost to them and came at an enormous cost to the very people they they have always said that they that they care for that it did it did make me wonder where people actually stood i see what you're getting at in that and it's and it's really interesting because the more divided we all are on these on these social issues and the more we insist that those are a reason not to engage in, with anybody else the more we live in the economic order as it is yeah, that's the reason why Robert Kennedy Jr. is treated like he has three ads because he's critical of the vaccine, etc., to make it completely unpalatable because there is a fear that he might actually get some consensus. And maybe it starts with just being aware of how your instinctive, oh, I can't even engage with that person. They they have a belief that I find repugnant in this in this way. Maybe maybe the first step for all of us is to say, okay, how repugnant is that belief, particularly if, if they're not seeking to impose it on me and it's just what 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 they believe. And does my dislike of their belief mean that I can't talk to them about anything else either? Maybe that maybe that's a good a good first step for all of us because we we do have that for some reason. And we have become very instinctively that 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 way that has either happened or been done to us, <laughs> depending on how active the conspiracy is and how much is just a subtle under the surface thing. But the interesting question is, how long will it last in the conservative uh, space? I honestly think he maybe is only conservative because he's deeply Catholic, but he's not really conservative in, in many dimension. And it does remind me, as I said, of, of the left of the Christian Democrats that were conservative from a social point of view, but uh, from every other point of view, they were kind of a moderate left. I, I guess I, I am still struggling to figure out how truthful he is being, either with us or with himself, about that his willingness to work with people who don't share his religious beliefs because he has written things in places that very tightly entwine his religious beliefs with his fundamental worldview. He quoted somebody in something he wrote, Archbishop Charles Chaput, writing that if traditional moral precepts are purely religious beliefs, then they can't be rationally defended. And because they're rationally indefensible, they should be treated as a form of prejudice. Thus, 2,000 years of moral truth and religious principle become by sleight of hand a species of, 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 of bias. And so he does, he believes 
believes in these traditional moral precepts, his religious beliefs, in a very deep and important way. Yeah, but I don't see that necessarily as a fault. The proof is in the pudding, and his book is really not trying to impose any of his social views. And it's a, I was shocked. In fact, I later realized that he had very strong uh, opinion because from the book is not that strong. And even the Catholic tradition is mentioned one or twice. is not in your face as much as uh, I've heard in some of the interviews. So I think that he's really walking the talk. Yeah, you could you could argue that the proof is in the pudding, both in that he was able to write an entire book without dwelling on his social views, and that he was able to give a persuasive answer in 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 the interview and and in talking to him about how he sees compromise and how he sees the ability the ability to get get things done. And I think the examples he drew um, the examples he drew were were compelling. So I think my honestly my my doubt is on the other side of the spectrum whether. Elizabeth Warren, but even more so AOC and company, are willing to put aside for a second their uh, religious belief, because at this point some of them are religious belief, in order to achieve something with uh, the more conservative. That, that's, that's incredibly fair. That's incredibly fair. And I think that that's, that's a really good question to raise. Capital Isn't is a podcast from the University of Chicago Podcast Network and the Stiegler Center in collaboration with the Chicago Booth Review. Also check out promarket.org, a publication of the Stiegler Center. The show is produced by me, Matt Hodap, and Lita Cesarin with production assistance from Utsov Gandhi, Sebastian Berka, and Brooke Fox. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>